Okay, let's get started. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it's me again, so no surprise. Um, I hope you don't get bored. So we'll have two more lectures today and then two more tomorrow. Um, these liquids just make me stressed out, but I hope I won't touch them. Uh, they're too close to the laptop. Um, okay, so today we will switch gears. Uh, yesterday I gave a talk uh, about exoplanets. Today and tomorrow uh, it will be a very different topic. In fact, I mean, tom tomorrow will be uh, even different from today. So today the idea is to introduce the idea of dark matter, pretty much lay out the problem and then um, discuss some solutions to it in the cosmological context. I won't go very much into the particle physics details of the problem because we have a special uh, lecturer, um, Tracy, who is my academic sister. We share the same advisor. She'll be in town uh, in a few days and she'll give a couple of talks, one of which will cover the particle physics aspect of the dark matter problem. So I'm not going to touch that part very much except the fact that I will discuss the GEV access problem. So here's just a quick outline of the four lectures that I will be uh, giving. So today's lecture, the lecture one, is about dark matter and its structure in the universe. So by structure, I, I mean spatial distribution as a function of time. Uh, we will discuss various aspects of the structure formation and how dark matter is involved in this. Uh, and uh, second lecture, which will be uh, the second lecture of today, it will be about gravitational strong lensing, or in fact, I will start with gravitational lensing as a general idea and then go into strong lensing, the lensing in the strong re uh, regime. And then tie it to astrophysics, just show some pretty pictures about how strong lenses actually come into existence in our universe. Uh, lecture three, which will happen tomorrow afternoon, it will be about probabilistic cataloging. I'm sure it doesn't mean anything to you when I say that. And it's all fine because um, it's, it's a recent idea that we are trying to introduce into the astrophysics literature, rather astrostatistics literature. It's, um, so lecture three will be mostly about statistics. So it will, it will contain minimal physics and maximal computer science and statistics. So it will be a different flavor and kind of uh, lead the way into lecture four, where we will bring ideas from lecture one, two, and three together to try to answer some questions about the small scale structure of the dark matter. Uh, so it will contain pretty much materials from all the three previous lectures. And prob hopefully by then you will understand what probabilistic cataloging is and why it's important. So these four are the lectures. Now, um, yesterday I was expecting actually more questions during the lecture. So please, please do feel free to stop me and ask questions. So uh, like this has to be interactive. Otherwise, I, I just can't uh, see or probe how much uh, information is being transferred. So I, yeah, let, let's make this as interactive as possible. Um, and I, I will certainly leave some time at the very end for questions. I did not plan for 50 minutes lectures. I, I planned for slightly less. So uh, there will be ample time for, for discussions um, So by the, by, the, by the end. So, okay. So now coming to today's lecture, the lecture one about dark matter and structure. So there will be three components to the lecture. First, I will talk about evidence for dark matter. Uh, basically why we think there is something called dark matter. Second part, I will talk about its structure. As I said, it's the spatial distribution. Uh, and they are tightly connected, and hopefully that will become clear why. And in the last part, I will talk about the so-called GEV excess. Uh, some of you may have heard the idea. Some, probably many of you who don't think about dark matter on a daily basis haven't even heard the idea. That's totally fine as well. I will talk about uh, um, uh, what it is first and why it's important. It's, it's one of the problems I worked on during my PhD. Okay, so 
coming now uh, hierarchically going down uh, to the evidence for dark matter. So I will uh, start uh, the lecture uh, pretty much going a century earlier. Um, so think about early 20th century where people were just even realizing that our galaxy is not the only galaxy in the universe. Back then people were just calling what we call today as galaxies just NOAA or basically like when they saw um, new objects or just like nebulae whenever they didn't understand what, what that meant. But early 20th century evidence started to build that there's additional galaxies, in fact later billions of them, and people started uh, asking questions like um, how do these stars in those galaxies uh, move? including our own obviously i mean the, the first order question you should ask is how do the stars in our own galaxy move but then you can ask that question for other uh, other galaxies as well so in this plot uh, for example you see an example of such a or the, or the answer to uh, an example answer to such a question where on the x-axis you see basically the radius from the center of the galaxy and on the y-axis you see the circular velocity in kilometers per second in units of kilometers per second and there's a bunch of data points and two theoretical curves on the plot so if you just uh, concentrate on the yellow data points those are essentially come from starlight so you people I won't go into details very much now but things will progress so they just measure somehow the um, velocities of the stars and they make up the um, yellow uh, data points with certain uncertainties involved um, and it would shown with the uh, pale blue uh, is the same type of data but they actually the, those data points come from a different source of uh, a different source they, they come from 21 centimeter uh, emission of hydrogen but eventually you see that they are actually increasing now if you just stop and think about very basic Newtonian dynamics so go to the left hand side now um, Newtonian dynamics tells us that acceleration has to be equal to the gravitational constant capital G times the mass enclosed inside some uh, hypothetical sphere let's call it m sub r as a function of radius and divided by r squared that's just simple Newtonian dynamics and uh, just taking the, this at, at face value um, the circular velocity then becomes uh, basically um, it has to have a dependence of 1 over square root of r so just starting from this theoretical expectation people people were expecting that when you collect such data the circular velocity of stars as a function of galactocentric radius must decrease at least past certain radius now very close to the galactic center things are wonky so no one really knows what's happening but at least very far from the galaxy it has to be the fact that uh, the circular velocities should fall off I mean maybe not necessarily just 1 over square root of r but at least it should fall off uh, but that was certainly not observed and this first was observed for our own galaxy and then later for other galaxies and this started to become known as the flat rotation curve problem the fact that the expectation was wildly different from observation about these rotation curves and obviously at this moment no one knew what was going on uh, people were wondering if there are other things that we cannot even see uh, in in fact this 21 centimeter hydrogen was a later addition into the game uh, in the in the very beginning people were only able to collect um, information from star and the, basically the, the the way you do that is you co uh, collect spectroscopic data to figure out uh, the line of sight velocity of stars and that tells you uh, you can infer then the circular velocity Yes, please. Are we uh, considering the effects of the gravitational effects of the things that we do see? Uh, I mean, other, for example, if you consider a star that is uh, uh, orbiting around the center of the galaxy, there are so many things in between. And, um, what do you mean by so many things in between? Other stars, planets. Uh, well, this does. Primordial black holes. I 
Hmm. Yes. OK, so this certainly does include all the stars. So primordial black holes uh, are basically just, we don't know if they exist, but I think you meant dead stars like actual black holes that we know that they exist. They, in, in, in mass budget, they're small, but certainly has to be taken into account if you, if you are going to do this. And <clears throat> uh, later studies eventually started accounting for all of this. Now, you mentioned a couple of them. I can mention more. There's actually dust that you have to take into account. Uh, there is obviously gas. Um, so that has to be taken into account. There is cosmic rays you also have to take into account. I'm not claiming that these, when you consider the mass budget, these are dominant. But still, you, you want to take them into account. But, uh, and there might be like rocks, like not necessarily black holes, but things that just don't radiate, radiate much in optimal waves, but still are just baryonic matter that we know that they exist. Uh, people have wondered whether these could actually be the case. And I will come to that at, uh, during the talk. Um, there ha it just happens that they cannot make up more than like 15% of, of this type of mass. They're called massive uh, objects, uh, uh, compact objects, and they, they just can't make it. They're not enough. They're not enough. Yeah. They exist, but they're not enough. OK, any other questions on this plot? Crystal clear. OK. Uh, well, things uh, obviously evolve, and uh, th th there will be eventually more uh, opportunities to ask questions, too. OK, um, so this was just the circular velocities of stars in our galaxy. But uh, another thing you, you can do is you can use the virial theorem. So um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the idea, but virial theorem essentially allows you to extract information statistically from systems in which you just cannot solve uh, analytically. Like if you have a two-body problem, you can just solve for the three-dimensional position vector and the three-dimensional velocity vector of both objects analytically. That's fine. Uh, if you have three bodies, then you can just do some uh, approximation. You can do it maybe. But if you have 10 bodies, 100 bodies, a million bodies, you just can't do that. So you have to rely on some statistical method to come up with a relation between the kinetic energy and the potential energy. And virial theorem is just that. It just simply says that if you have a bunch of particles, then the average uh, kinetic energy is half the uh, average uh, um, potential energy in the system. So using this, uh, Fritz Wicke, who is in the picture, uh, who is making a funny sign. So he basically used the virial theorem to say, OK, here, here's some cluster of galaxies. And that cluster is actually going to be shown in the next slide. That's the coma cluster. So this is a bunch of galaxies sitting together, gravitationally bound. He basically did the same experiment, but now for galaxies. So he said, let me just measure the uh, velocity dispersion of the galaxies. So that was an experimental challenge, but he did that. And eventually, he figured that the galaxies were moving at a, at a velocity that is too much in order for this galaxy cluster to stay intact. Now, um, another way to put this is if uh, you only had baryonic matter, that is the matter that we know and love in the standard model, then uh, if you just start some simulation with the initial condition that these galaxies have whatever velocities that you measure, then if you run the simulation forward, the galaxy cluster will just fly apart. It will not, you, you just cannot preserve it. And that's the same essentially for the galaxy. Like going just back to this picture, if you start a simulation with the stellar velocities that you observe without any dark matter, then the galaxy will just fly apart. It, it, you'll just not have any galaxy left in a few million years. Now, this is a problem. Why? Because we make cosmological observations, and obviously we use our sanity to say that galaxy, or in fact the universe, um, obviously it's evolving, that is true, but the universe is quasi-stable, like galaxies stay intact because you can actually observe galaxies over billions of years and you make sure that they actually stay intact. So that's certainly against observations that 
the uh, particles should just fly apart and you can't even make galaxies. And in order to make this conclusion, he used the video theorem where you just set basically the potential energy equal to the kinetic energy, which is, which is proportional to the temperature and the velocity dispersion of the galaxies in the cluster. Okay, so um, you can't really read this, but on the right side, I just put this. Uh, it, the, the context is really not important, but it just says nebulae as gravitational lenses. This is from uh, one of um, uh, Fritz Wicke's work. Uh, and it's just funny that at that time, he was just calling these guys as nebulae. And more, more importantly, he actually makes a pointer to galaxy gravitational lenses because that's a really cool idea that he actually put forward. And I will um, discuss that in, uh, in very much detail in the next lecture, gravita using gravitational lenses to actually understand dark matter more. Uh, but um, that was a very futuristic idea back, back then. Yes, please. Yes. And then Zwicky replied with a paper in Science whose content is basically, hey Al, you didn't read my paper on the coma cluster. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Einstein had a lot of prejudices, uh, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that note. Um, okay. Any questions so far? Nope. Okay. So another very important figure, Vera Rubin. I have to mention her name um, because, uh, first of all, she was a great scientist and certainly a, a leader for women astronomy, a woman in astronomy. Uh, but apart from that, he wa uh, she was also leading uh, the idea of dark matter in the sense that. I've just shown you one rotation curve, but uh, uh, she and Ford uh, working together, they basically published a paper, I think 1980 or something, where they uh, just nailed down the rotation curve, the flat rotation curves of many galaxies. Uh, and um, if you just stack them on top of each other, you get a figure like this, which is really cool, that uh, just very, very clearly shows that uh, rotation curves are flat, uh, or at least pseudo-flat. They're, they're certainly not decreasing, and that there is a very, very serious cosmological problem, uh, however you want to name it, but by, by then it was clearly named the dark matter problem, or the missing matter problem, if you want to really don't want to call it dark. Because it's certainly not dark. I will come to that, but it's, it's, it's got nothing with blackness. Okay, so, so far so good, um, and I'm a little slow, but it's fine. Um, so I've discussed the rotation uh, recur problem. However, if you just take that as the only evidence for introducing a cosmological component, people might start laughing because Unfortunately, in physics, you need extraordinary evidence in order to uh, postulate extraordinary theories. And dark matter is certainly an extraordinary theory. So if it was only the rotation curves, we probably wouldn't be believing in the existence of dark matter. However, the, sim the, the, the story is much more complicated. And I will just showcase a couple of examples from this story. The, the very first one that deserves attention is the so-called cosmic microwave background. So in 1695, uh, just by coincidence, two people called Arno Penzias and Robert Wilson discovered a source of noise. That's a funny term, but actually that's true. What they were looking for at that time was the hydrogen, neutral hydrogen emission from the galaxy. That was a very hot topic back then because people were trying to understand the rotation curve of the galaxy and trying to make a map of the hydrogen emission. That it, that, by the way, that hydrogen emission is the 21 centimeter emission, which comes from the fine splitting um, 
of, of the two states uh, you probably know from quantum physics. So uh, they were trying to look for that signal. And then they started to realize that there was a source of noise. However, they rotated their instrument. And wherever they looked, whenever they looked, they were just getting a constant noise, which was a nuisance. And they were just suspecting that it could have been the pigeons in the instrument or anything like that. They just did everything to remove the noise. However, they failed. And eventually, they just made that uh, leap of reasoning to say that there was actually a source out there, not even in our uh, solar system, not in our galaxy, but actually extragalactic. And they called it the cosmic microwave background. Cosmic in the sense that it's a cosmological, it's, it sits in the cosmological context. It's certainly not galactic, it's extragalactic. Uh, microwave, because it's actually in uh, hundreds of gigahertz. Well, it's a thermal, it's, it's got a thermal spectrum, which means that it's, it's, uh, you cannot just give a particular um, uh, wavelength, but it's got a thermal spectrum, it, but it peaks at about 150 gigahertz. And it's a background radiation because it's at the background of pretty much anything that you hope to uh, get uh, using an extra instrument like this. So cosmic microwave background is a very, very important object for physicists and astronomers. So this is a picture uh, of the, or the full sky picture of the CMB anisotropy. So I have to mention that um, I was just saying that CMB basically is constant everywhere, and that is certainly true. The reason I said that, that is not uh, technically true, but I, I did still said that just because the, the monopole term, if you just take a full sky map and decompose it in uh, spherical harmonics, and you can just start uh, talking about the monopole, the, po the, the, the component that's uh, just constant across the sky, or the dipole, which basically changes 100, uh, completely 180 degrees away. So those two terms are really important. The monopole term is extremely larger compared to whatever other higher terms you might have from that spherical harmonic decomposition. So th th because that is so large, we say that CMB is constant across the sky. Certainly that is not true because of two reasons. First, there is the dipole term, and that is, that is not a cosmological thing. That is just because our local group is in motion with respect to the CMB, cosmic microwave background. And also, also because our Earth, for example, has some rotation around the star. Our star has a rotation about the galaxy, etc. There are other types of motions as well. Uh, but second, there is actually primordial anisotropies in the CMB not related to our motion in the universe. And that part is really, really important, pristine information. So that's, that's, that's uh, the part that will teach us about dark matter. Now, um, so far so good. The, the, the takeaway message from this slide is that the initial conditions to the universe uh, must have been really, really homogeneous. And I haven't really made that connection yet, so I should probably make that before making this statement. So cosmic microwave background radiation is a radiation that we think is coming from the Big Bang, uh, the beginning of time. Uh, obviously, not. I don't really mean t is equal to 0, but I actually mean t is equal to about 400,000 years. Uh, and uh, back then, what was really happening was uh, the, basically, if you just think about the universe at its very early stages, the universe is pretty hot and dense and uh, has a really high pressure in the very beginning. And then as the universe expands, the pressure goes down, the temperature goes down. And uh, when the temperature goes down, temperature just means average kinetic energy per molecule. So eventually, there, ha there happens to be a time in which the mean kinetic energy of the, uh, of, uh, of the constituents, which, which are essentially electrons and protons, becomes lower than the binding energy of the hydrogen atom. Once that happens, we call that recombination. Uh, the electron and the proton recombines to form neutral hydrogen atom. And once that happens, a, a very special moment in the, un in the history of the universe takes place, simply because uh, the photons that used to be just scattering all around, just because the electrons and protons are charged particles, 
suddenly are let free at the time of the recombination because after the recombination you have neutral hydrogen whereas before recombination you have charged particles so photons suddenly have a much higher mean free path uh, than before and that's essentially that 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 is the result that that is why we tend to observe these photons from from this last scattering surface about 400,000 years after the big bang uh, pretty much unimpeded i mean the, the the mean free path of the cmb photons is really large Yes. Yes. Thanks for the note. So this picture basically only shows the um, the uh, the the terms that are higher than the dipole, uh, and that essentially is important because if I were to show the iso, iso uh, the, the monopole, uh, it would be a very boring picture. It would just be a single color with without any information. If I were to show you the dipole, which is about millikelvin. So the, by the way, I didn't give the numbers, but the uh, monopole is 2.7 Kelvin. The dipole is about a millikelvin. So if I were to show you the dipole, the dipole would just be like a very smooth picture with two poles. Uh, but if you just remove those two, then you get this type of picture. There are certain features. The most obvious feature is a degree size feature, which I will come to at the very end of the talk when I talk about baryonic as, uh, acoustic oscillations. But that's, that's a result of this uh, propagation of uh, pressure waves. But we'll, we will come to that. Uh, but essentially, you see uh, fluctuations of all scales. So these are actually cosmological and very, very interesting. Yes, please. Yes. So removing the dipole obviously makes the assumption that all the dipole is due to the, uh, the motion. And they are degenerate, so we would have no hope of finding if there was a dipole that is cosmological. That is simply not possible. I mean, they are completely degenerate. What you can do is you can study like the, the, the fourth or the eighth order um, uh, monopole, the, the, the multipoles, like the, the octopole and the quadrupole, uh, they start containing some cosmological information. For example, one, one, one thing that may catch your eye is this cold spot here. Uh, things like that, you may see hmm, maybe there was some process pre-inflation that caused this and people have, won have wondered about that. But the problem with that is we have only a couple of such modes and we have a really large cosmic variance. So no one really can say for sure that they point to a particular physical process um, before the Big Bang. Uh, but you can only speculate, and unfortunately, we, we have only one universe to observe. Other questions? Okay, so if you take that map and do the spherical harmonic decomposition that I was just talking about, you get basically this picture. This picture uh, tells you the power spectrum of the CMB, the cosmic microwave background. Uh, the power spectrum, uh, essentially this is uh, rescaled, so it basically tells you the, the power in every uh, frequency or, uh, um, uh, so th this, this L is the spherical harmonic component, so it's in the frequency domain uh, most, uh, rather than uh, position domain. So in every frequency bin, it tells you how much power there is. So if you basically sum up all the, um, all, all the Y values here and uh, multiply uh, by the bin width, then you basically start getting the, obviously this is a discrete one, I, I, I'm giving the analogy here. So you basically get the full variance of the CMB. Uh, this is just breaking down the variance into components. And um, so this power essentially is, contains a lot of information about the initial conditions of the universe. I won't go very much into detail because the idea is to discuss dark matter here. So there is a lot to talk about. Like I, one could give like a 10 hour lecture on just one, one plot here. It's, it's really rich physics. But I will only just mention that this very first acoustic peak here wouldn't just be there if we did not have dark matter. And um, well, 
if you did not have dark matter, this would just look wildly different, not just the acoustic peaks, but the, the thing that would affect, get affected most if we did not have dark matter was, uh, would be this, the, these acoustic peaks. And just putting it in layman terms, the reason is dark matter um, particles, I think I have a plot on that. No, I, I don't, sorry. Okay, uh, that will come later, but um, I'll just state it uh, in, 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 in words, dark matter uh, doesn't, we, we think that dark matter doesn't interact electromagnetically with the rest of the cosmic plasma. That means prior to recombination, when um, the baryonic matter, that is the electrons, the protons, and various other particles that you know, are tightly coupled to the photons, just because they're tightly coupled to a radiation field, they, the, the, um, the uh, density perturbations, the contrast, the density contrast in them cannot grow much. They, it just grows so slowly, it's stalled, basically. Uh, however, dark matter, not being coupled to the rest of the, uh, the guys in the cosmic plasma, is freely able to just uh, grow its uh, structure prior to the, big, uh, to the epoch of recombination. That is the key point here. Because dark matter, if dark matter exists and is decoupled from the rest of the cosmic plasma, it actually contains a lot of structure that is um, not visible in the, uh, in the baryonic matter. Now, that, why, does, why is that important? Well, the idea is the following. If you just start uh, a simulation, an embodied simulation, cosmological simulation, with the initial conditions tied to this type of anisotropies, you unfortunately get a junk universe. You just can't produce galaxies because this type of initial condition is not enough. If, if this was the only type of density contrast you had, then about 13.8 billion uh, years after the Big Bang, you just cannot produce the richness of structure that we see around us today in the, in the universe. All these galaxies and stars and planets, etc. We cannot produce them. The only way to produce them is to have additional structure at the time of the recombination. And in order to produce that, you postulate the existence of an addi additional component called the dark matter that basically starts growing its structure prior to the epoch of recombination. So you see the idea. There is an additional component that must exist in order for our universe to, to grow enough structure by today. That's the key point, and hopefully will become more clear towards the end of the lecture when I talk about So this is like an, more like an introduction. So, um, so here you see a picture of the large scale structure of the universe. So the, these guys basically are called filaments. And so the, basically the, uh, the uh, scale of this contains pretty much the observed universe. It's, it's like you looking at the universe from above, well, um, only literally, I, I don't mean uh, it, but uh, just laying out all the known galaxies. Th this data uh, basically comes from spectroscopic surveys, and it just tells us that there's a lot of structure, not just in a, at our scales like stars, planets, etc., but also at the very large scales. In order to produce those very large scale uh, uh, structures, you have to start structure formation very early, and the, the only way to do that is to propose the existence of dark matter. Okay, so another point about baryonic uh, acoustic oscillations. So uh, I've already talked about the fact that there are certain sound waves in the universe uh, prior to the recombination, and those uh, sound waves basically propagate at a particular speed. And by the time of the recombination, it reaches a particular distance. In commoving coordinates, that distance is about 100 megaparsecs, roughly, very roughly. And if basically, if you make a plot of the two-point correlation function of all the galaxies in the universe, basically just look for correlations, then you actually get a bump at about 100 megaparsecs. That's one of the coolest results in cosmology. It's a result by Daniel 
Eisenstein, who was in my thesis advising committee, and uh, he basically has has led this um, uh, this effort, and it it had basically like many generations. Currently, there is the fourth generation experiment trying to reconfirm this and make it even measure uh, measure it even finer, and this bump basically allows one to um, infer a lot about the pre-recombination physics or universe because it tells you very, very uh, um, precisely this, the speed of the sound in the cosmic plasma. And it tells you how much radiation there is, how much dark matter there is, all the dynamics of the fluid uh, in, in the cosmic plasma. OK, so now we will switch gears again. Um, I, I, I've, I've, I'm done with the CMB part of the evidence, but the list of evidence, uh, possible evidence that you could um, count for dark matter actually is pretty long. So I will only showcase some of them, as I said. Uh, another evidence actually comes from so-called gravitational lensing. And I won't really go into much detail about this because it is the main topic of my next lecture. Um, that's why I, let me not uh, spend too much time on it other than saying that gravitational lensing essentially um, wouldn't happen the way it does if we did not have dark matter. And without actually defining what gravitational lensing is, that statement actually is very, very uh, fertile, but uh, you get the idea. So we'll, we will discuss that uh, in detail later. So I don't want to steal away uh, second lecture's material. Um, OK. so. Um, another piece of evidence we have is from the Big Bang nucleosynthesis by just looking at certain stars uh, that, that are not very uh, evolved. You can start figuring out the, the ratios of the primordial elements, uh, the elemental abundances, and that tells you roughly the baryon to photon ratio in the universe, or rather the average baryon density, or the amount of baryon there is in the universe as a function of the energy content of the universe. And that number is about 5%, very roughly. And um, it, it, although it's not a very precise number, I think the mean value tells you something about it. That is, uh, we only can see electromagnetically 5% of the universe. The rest is uh, dark matter and yet another component that I haven't even mentioned and won't really mention in these lectures, the so-called dark energy. Um, they basically together make up the concordance model of uh, cosmology. But the idea here is that um, there is yet additional evidence, apart from the CMB, apart from rotation curves, that if you just start counting baryons in the universe, they, they just can't make up for the, for, for the full uh, energy budget of the universe. Um, OK, so yet another evidence I think that's worth noting is uh, syst uh, are, are, are systems in which uh, you see a collusion, let's say, between galaxy clusters. But at the end of the collusion, you figure out that the, the sum content of the ga galaxy clusters are essentially not impeded by this collusion. And uh, the baryonic component that you see is actually impeded or is subject to friction or collusion. So it, this, this plot basically shows the, uh, the collusion of two clusters. It's called, you probably know the name, it's called the bullet cluster. Um, so what's happening here is you have two clusters, and the clusters obviously have a lot of uh, hot gas in them, the intracluster medium. So uh, the, the red uh, color is showing basically the, uh, the uh, the visible uh, hot gas that's um, basically very hot just because it, it just collided with the other cluster. Uh, but you can see that it's, it's, it's got the shape that it's almost like went through the other cluster and it's uh, as a result of the, uh, the collusion. Now, wondering about the blue, the blue part is actually not a direct electromagnetic measurement. You, you don't just uh, measure the, gravi the gravitational field. What you do is you rely on gravitational lensing, which I hopefully will eventually define. Um, but you rely on gravitational lensing to say, OK, there is this amount of matter 
along that line of sight and just integrating, integrating that you figure out that there is a lot of mass that is not impeded by this collision. Now what this means is the clusters essentially have two mass components, one of which is collisional, the other is collisionless, or at least has a really large uh, limit or small limit, tight limit on, the, uh, on its ability to collide. So that is yet another property that we expect from dark matter. So bringing those um, um, ingredients, so the dark matter that I've already talked about, I haven't really mentioned the dark energy, but let me just spend a minute on it, just so the picture is complete. So uh, in the last 20 years, we've, uh, I think you've already um, listen to many talks or maybe even heard them in the news, but uh, the, 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 we know that the universe is um, expanding in an accelerated rate, and that basically comes from type 1a supernova data. So we just look at uh, the, the luminosities of, uh, uh, or rather the brightnesses of the type 1a supernova, and just because they're standard candles, that is, they have a standard uh, luminosity, we can infer the distance to them. And by just laying out those distances, you figure out as a function of redshift what's the acceleration rate of the universe. And that tells you basically the acceleration history of the universe. And in order to um, be in, in, uh, in agreement with the observations, we need to postulate an additional component which is homogeneous across the universe. So it's not like dark matter, which is clumpy. Dark, dark energy must be almost like homogeneous, like the, uh, the vacuum energy, uh, with a negative pressure. So it actually accelerates the universe as opposed to collapsing it. So th there has to be an additional component, which, by the way, in energy density is even larger than the dark matter. It's about 68% of the universe. Um, anyway, so bringing those two together, and also the matter that we know and love, the barrier matter and in addition there is uh, well um, I, I also have to mention there's the neutrinos and the photons the radiation bringing all of these together we now have a cosmic chart of the energy budget and that's called the uh, lambda CDM model lambda stands for the dark energy CDM stands for cold dark matter so that's the standard model of cosmology today uh, and this plot by Max Tegmark basically shows the uh, various data uh, points that uh, show agreement with this uh, lambda CDM model. On the left hand side you have the largest scales, like the CMB scales, so these green data points. And on the right hand side you have the smallest scales. These basically come from the Lyman Alpha Forest and then you have weak lensing measurements and basically counting clusters in the universe. And also the, the picture I was just showing, the spectroscopic picture, uh, these surveys essentially uh, count galaxies in the universe. And you have a collection of data points which agree with the prediction of the lambda CDM. Uh, and I haven't even de defined axis, sorry. Uh, this is wave number, so inverse distance. And this basically is the uh, power spectrum associated with it. Again, just power as a function of uh, wave number. Um, so we now have a great agreement uh, between observation and lambda CDM that makes us very happy. But there are still problems with lambda CDM, which I will come to in the fourth lecture at very, very small scales. But it actually doesn't make sense to point to the right in this plot because this plot assumes linear growth, like this is wave number. However, at some point, uh, when structure grows in the universe, it becomes nonlinear after certain points. So we will come to that as well. Um, however, before I talk about uh, uh, structure formation, just one thing, uh, just summing up the story now. Dark matter must be cold. So I haven't really defined cold. Cold means uh, non-relativistic, but if we want it to be cold, not in not at an arbitrary time, but at by, or I should say by, not at, but by, the CMB. Uh, sorry, CMB's uh, recombination. So the, the, uh, by the production of the CMB, or rather put in, putting it in a, a different way, by the epoch of recombination. We want it to be non-relativistic just because if it was relativistic, it would just be like radiation and it would dilute away the density uh, contrast. So if you want to grow structure, you want a non-relativistic component. That's the key point here. 
Second, you want it to be weakly interacting. I think I have motivated this point enough by showing the bullet cluster. Um, and by that, I really mean it's transparent, not dark, not black. Uh, I think a transparent matter would be a better uh, name for dark matter. However, dark just means, or is, is a dark is an adjective that uh, conveys our ignorance about it. So I think in that sense, it's, it's fine. Um, so dark energy is dark in the same sense that we don't understand it. And it's probably collisionless. I just said probably just because there are also models of dark matter in which you have some level of collision uh, in, in the model, but not very much because there are limits on it. And it must be quasi-stable. By that, I mean dark matter shouldn't decay. Because if, it, if dark matter did decay, then it would not address your cosmological problem because it could solve your problems in the early universe, it could solve your problems during the dark ages, but it wouldn't solve your problem today. Uh, because by the late universe, you would have structure just uh, diluting away, and you don't want that to happen. There are many dark matter models in which the dark matter particle is quasi-stable. That is, it's not like proton, which has a lifetime of like 10 to 14, 34 years, but it basically can live up to a Hubble time, and maybe in a few billion years, the dark matter will start decaying. Maybe. We don't know. Uh, oh, OK. I, I have some slides, uh, but I think I've already mentioned. Uh, yes, I, I, maybe I just didn't say kinetically decoupled. So I've, when I say uh, recombination, I think I, I should be more precise here. So I said re, uh, epoch of recombination, but we really don't know when dark matter actually decoupled from, from the rest of the cosmic plasma. So technically speaking, we really want it to be called, that is non-relativistic, uh, when it's kinetically decoupled from, from the rest of the cosmic plasma. That's a better way to put it. Uh, and we certainly don't want to be hot, non-relativistic. Uh, it can be warm. By warm, I mean it, it can basically have a, a, a free streaming length that is comparable if you basically project that to project that distance to today's standards you can have a free streaming that is of order the dwarf galaxy size but you don't want that distance the free streaming distance to be larger than that then you would be erasing structure that you s actually observe today in the universe that is that shouldn't happen. So this warm dark matter is usually um, modeled by sterile neutrinos. Uh, I might say something about that later on. And I also mentioned this weakly interacting. I'll pass that. Uh, OK, so the self-interaction must be low for the same reason. Uh, just to quote a number, that's a very useful number to remember. Uh, it's about a barn per GeV, um, the cross-section that you, that you allow. Anything lower than that is fine. But anything larger than that, uh, you start not producing the bullet cluster. That's no good. And it must be quasi-stable for reasons I mentioned. So we sit here at the moment. That's the epoch of recombination. That's basically the inflation. And dark matter can essentially decay any time in between. But it, it shouldn't completely decay, at least by now. Otherwise, it wouldn't solve the dark matter problem. OK, so one thing I should probably mention before going into the particle uh, nature. No, no, dark matter does interact gravitationally. Uh, so it interacts uh, gravitationally with the other matter, bionic matter. Yes. Does it interact uh, internally? Uh, so so self-interaction can happen, but only, so there is a self-interacting dark matter model, but there is actually an upper limit to its self-interaction. However, by self-interaction, we don't mean gravitational. Gravitational interaction is common. Like, um, so gravitational interaction does, uh, is true for baryonic matter as well as dark matter in the same sense. Yes. Oh, sorry, two questions. Let's, let's go one by one. Sorry, who, who was asking the question? I missed. You? OK. Uh, 
before. Um, well, prior to recombination, the only observational evidence we have is the Big Bang nucleosynthesis. And that only tells us about the baryonic abundance. Um, so uh, we learn pretty much all we know about dark matter from either current galaxies by just studying how fluffy they are, etc., the uh, rotation curves, etc., the abundance of galaxies, but these are all late time effects, and also the CMB. But I mean on only observational effects. There are many models. Uh, I, d I don't, I'm not referring to the models themselves. We know a lot. So if you, what you meant by knowing is, is the number of models we have. We have zillions of models about what dark matter could be doing. OK. Yes? What are what? Well, if dark matter self-interacts, uh, first of all, it would the, the most obvious result it would, uh, would be to erase structure at smallest scales. In lambda CDM, in cold dark matter scenarios, um, matter starts clumping at the very, very smallest scales. Um, obviously, there's always a finite stream, free streaming for any type of uh, uh, component, including dark matter, but that free streaming uh, length is extremely small. So in lambda CDM, you may have clumps as small as the Earth itself, like pretty small, I mean. However, with, when you introduce self-interaction, that starts smoothing out those structures. So basically, you end up with a universe that very much looks like the warm dark matter model, with certain differences, because when you have interactions, it also changes the sphericity, like there might be triaxiality, et cetera. But um, th those are always secondary effects. The most obvious one would be erasing the structure that has basically implications also for non uh, indirect detection of dark matter, because it changes the number of clumps that you expect to exist, and that changes the, the, um, the amplitude of the uh, annihilation signal that you expect. So it's like a pipeline that, um, that feeds into the indirect detection as well. So do we have uh, rigid evidence that dark matter has structure? Um, well, the, 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 the evidence we have is CMB plus uh, it has to have at least the structure that the baryonic matter has. Otherwise, I mean, both are gravitationally interacting, so at least that must be the case. But I think you are referring to structure that is smaller, for example, than the, like the dwarf-sized galaxies, etc. That we don't actually have. That is an extrapolation of the model, and we don't have evidence. The smallest structures that we see are these dwarf galaxies, the smallest dwarf galaxies in the local group that we have observed. They have masses of order 10 to 6, ma uh, 10 to 6 solar masses, a million solar masses. But that's it. Anything lower than that, we just don't have evidence for. Probably not. Yeah. Like Gravitino. Yeah. Yes, please. Yes, please. Yeah. So there's a class of models where the gravitino, where you have supersymmetry, and the gravitino is the lightest supersymmetry particle. So in those models, Gravitino is the dark matter. It is a uh, so called uh, super wind. It mm -hmm. only has gravitational interactions, and you can never discover it in direct detection. However, a property of those models is that all other supersymmetric particles decay to the gravitino, sometimes rapidly. And so, by discovering supersymmetric particles and analyzing their decays, and seeing this particular regularity, mm. you can actually directly discover the gravity. 
Okay. So you have to really look at the whole model and see what its implications are before you say okay. Yeah. yeah, good point. Yeah. I guess everyone has a def different definition. Some people like to see actually the particle itself just decay or something, but I think that's a great point. Like sometimes the models have some degeneracy, so you have to actually constrain it from some other direction and just uh, indirectly infer the existence of, of a particle. Um, I think that we uh, discovered the tau neutrino as soon as we discovered the tau electron. Yeah. Because there's something missing highly constrained, so what else can it be? Yeah. Now, other people claim that the tau neutrino was discovered 20 years later in some Right, yeah. Yeah. Uh, was there a different, yes, yes. Uh, as being the lightest particle, uh, as you mentioned, uh, isn't being non-relativistic, isn't it a contradiction? Um, okay, so, but, uh, so dark matter is, is probably, um, so dark matter, for example, talking about the weakly interacting massive particles, has to be non-relativistic, and it's actually very massive. It's like 100 GeV. Uh, so there are lighter light bosons that can make up dark matter, but they uh, behave very differently because they're non-thermal, they're bosonic, they, they're, they, they, they're, they're, their model is very different. They behave like waves. They're not like fermions. Yes. 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 Yeah. Yes, so actually this will be the main topic of my fourth lecture, but I've certainly let's just uh, discuss that real quick. So there are many solutions to this uh, core cusp, too big to fail, and missing satellites problems of lambda CDM at small scales. Um, there's uh, one solution is self-interacting dark matter. Another solution is warm dark matter, where you introduce some, uh, some temperature uh, to, to the dark matter at kinetic decoupling. Uh, and these are all fine. I mean, certainly, as, uh, the, 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 they, they can be a reality. Or there's wave-like dark matter, as you mentioned as well. Um, I think at the moment, no one knows which one is better. Like, we, we certainly haven't singled out one of them. That's certainly true. But I would even argue further that we don't even know which one is a better candidate. Uh, because this is, this is a really old problem, but a problem that lacks very much observational data. Uh, so for a long time, people have written papers based on their prior beliefs rather than the um, the, the method uh, effect, effect. So I, I think all these models are certainly possible. And I, I really wouldn't claim one better than the other. Uh, what about computer simulations? Is it possible to distinguish by using the simulations? Or is it well, computer simulation is for forward modeling the, the model. So for a given, for every given model, you can uh, start a uh, hydrodynamical simulation that forward models your whatever initial condition is. And pretty much all these models that I enumerated can solve the problem in different versions. So they're kind of degenerate. Unless we get a particle, uh, basically a signal from the particle nature of them, it may be even impossible to distinguish. Uh, so wave-like dark matter behaves slightly different. So I, I, would, I would say wave-like dark matter is slightly different than the others. So the self-interacting one and the warm dark matter one, I think, look very much similar. It's really hard to distinguish those two. No, actually, it doesn't have to interact. So warm, warm dark matter, a good candidate for warm dark matter is sterile neutrino. Uh, a sterile neutrino is a neutrino that, is, uh, that doesn't interact weakly. 
So active neutrinos that we know and love basically interact gravitationally and also uh, weakly. Uh, sterile neutrinos don't interact weakly, they only interact gravitationally, and they're much more massive. They, well, we think they are, if they exist, they must be massive. Uh, they're like keV, kilo electron volt kind of uh, mass. And that's the right t mass uh, that you should uh, postulate in order to have your dark matter warm. Otherwise, it doesn't work. Uh, yes. Okay, let's do that. All right. 